Good evening, everybody. Welcome all to the History Center for this evening's program. We've got a very exciting one for you all tonight. My name is George. I'm the Programs Manager here at the History Center, and I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's program, Chicagoland Archaeology and Native American Past, with our guest speaker, Mr. Dan Lund. I want to say a couple words before we get started with tonight's program. This program, in partnership with Lake Forest Openlands, is our second lecture as part of the uh, lecture initiative titled Indigenous Connections to the Land, which is a part of the citywide multi-organizational initiative called Native Voices. So if you're familiar with the Native Voices initiative, it comprises a number of Lake Forest and Lake Bluff institutions, including Lake Forest Library, the History Center, Lake Forest College, Bellwell Farm, Lake Forest Openlands, of course, Gordon Community Center, among many others who have dedicated 2023 to exploring various parts of local Native American history. And so this program is the second, as I mentioned, the first program took place back on January 19th and featured Dennis Downs as he discussed the importance of Indian Trail marker trees. If you're interested in that program, we have a recording available on the History Center YouTube channel that you can watch free of charge if you'd like to go back and see that recording. Our final program for Indigenous Connections to the Land will take place here on March 8th, and Mr. Dan Malone will be returning for that program, and he'll be joined by Mr. Berlin Spreeman as they discuss the importance of Indian burial grounds and the new discoveries that have entered that field of study. I also wanted to mention that this program tonight will also be recorded. If you registered ahead of time for tonight's program, you'll automatically receive a link to that recording. If you didn't register online for this program, let me know after the program, and I'll be sure to take your name and email so that you definitely get a copy of tonight's recording. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome and introduce our guest speaker for tonight. For over 20 years, Dan Malone has been conducting archeological research within the Chicagoland area, Great Lakes region, and Kenya. He has surveyed hundreds of sites and compiled a large database recording indigenous and settler sites within the city and surrounding suburbs. He also works with the Menominee and Potawatomi descendants of Chief Alexander Robinson on the history of the chief, his family, and cemetery. And with that, I'd like you all to join in welcoming our guest speaker, Mr. Dan Malone. Thank you very much, George. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so, uh, thank you for saying that the lecture will be interesting, although my, glass, my, my, my voice is like a glass of warm milk, I'm sure, and you'll, you'll all be out before the end of it. Um, so, yes, I am an archaeologist. I'm not a navigational archaeologist. I'm not a pretend archaeologist. I'm a real degreed archaeologist, because I do get asked that question all the time. Are you an actual archaeologist? Do you have an advanced degree? Yes, yes, yes. I earned my advanced degrees in England, uh, where I studied at the University of Leicester. Uh, so I do work in Kenya. I've been working in Kenya since about 2000. I've been working in the African Anthropology Lab. Well, started there around 1997. Uh, and the guy that I work with there, he and I actually own a coffee farm together in Western Kenya, but we're not here for that. However, over the well, actually well over the past 30 years now, I've been doing local archaeology, Chicagoland archaeology. And so that means working early settler sites, farm sites, prehistoric sites, and also uh, historic Native American sites. I've worked with numerous museums in the area, historical societies, working on revamping various exhibits, uh, scientific affiliate field museum, and I'm currently working with Mitchell Museum of Collections to sort of revamp all of that. So that gives you the background uh, with my work with Alexander Robinson, Chi Chi Pinkwa, Chief Chi Chi Pinkwa. I work with both, as George mentioned, the Nami and Potawatomi descendants, and I'm one of their appointed uh, family historians. So without going any further, um, but that's just to give you the breakdown because I do get these questions, believe it or not, all the time. Yes, I can be self-centered. <laughs> and a little dismissive and what have you, but I assure you I had to say all that because I get the questions over and over, and I want to make sure that at least we lay a foundation for why I'm doing what I'm doing. 
So that said, we are looking at a timeline. We're going to go through the Chicagoland area. We're going to go from the prehistory to, well, not today. IAG stopped at about 1673 because everyone knows what happens after that. But the thing of it is that people, humans, indigenous people had occupied this landscape, landscape continuously, not in stop, for 13,000 years. Okay? 13,000 years of just the prehistory. And then everything that comes after that as well. So when I talk about prehistory, I'm not talking about people who don't have a history. Of course they have a history. It's just written in the materials that they left behind. Stone tools, pottery, village sites, the things that they that are normally found in archaeological sites. Yes. Is it possible to turn that light off if that's necessary? Uh, unfortunately, I don't know. George, would you be able to dismantle that light, please? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so when we're talking about that, they of course have a history. It's just written in the material culture that is found at the site. When we talk about historic Native Americans, we are talking about people who, when the Europeans came, were able to write these things down. That's the only difference, but everyone has a history. And again, I cannot stress it enough that Native people have 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 inhabited and still inhabit the landscape um, continuously. Uh, so I'm trying to what I'm trying to do is show you that in our mindset we have to think outside of Lake Forest, uh, outside of Lake County, outside of the Chicago land area. You're looking at a whole region in which these people moved. And we're looking at trade, we're looking at, at uh, utilizing the landscape and as well as the natural resources within that landscape. And they did that, and they did that going over many, many miles, not just focused in one local area. So you've got 13,000 years between the Paleo Indian and the Mississippian. The Mississippian is just a time in history in Cahokia. Up here, we have different forms of Mississippian as well that existed at the same time as the people in Cahokia. And then you also have, after that, we have what's called the proto-historic period. Now, during this period, you have the Sauk, the Fox, the Miami, the Illini, the Menominee, uh, the Ho-Chunk. All of these people lived within the area. Again, I'm showing this to you because when you look at the Potawatomi, look how close they are to us. Only 188 years, give or take, between us and them when they were removed from the landscape. There's over 1,190 years between the Potawatomi and the Mississippians. And then between them and the Taylor Indian, you've got 12,500 years of habitation. So that's a long time. But the Potawatomi, I'm not dismissing the Potawatomi, but I'm pointing it out for a reason. We're only here for a very short period of time. They came from southern Michigan, upper Wisconsin, and eventually the Chicago and area around the 1690s. Why am I saying that? Because I get questions. Is this stone tool Potawatomi? No, it's not. It's any of these prehistoric people that we're going to talk about. Uh, we didn't have Native people living in this area at the time for our historical records. When you're thinking Potawatomi, and maybe there wasn't a Potawatomi village in one specific area, but I can guarantee that these people definitely at one point or another inhabited any of those given areas at one point or another. And then finally, I have to point out that Native people still exist in the Chicago land area. And they are thriving and they are numerous as well. So we're talking about people in the past, but we have to remember those people still exist today. They are alive and well in the 21st century. So that all said, now that we're done with that, we're looking at a timeline. And when we look at the timeline up here, we have, of course, our humans made their way to North America during the Pleistocene epoch, during the Ice Age. Okay? Eventually, people entered Illinois roughly about 13,000 years ago, and those people are called the Paleo Indians. Now, Paleo Indian people were small in their groups, they weren't numerous. We're talking about people roaming a landscape, a landscape not only, which is unlike what we have today, right? We have back then, sort of a barren, cold landscape with spruce and pine forests and scrub. 
and they were hunting megafauna, large animals. The paleo Indians themselves, like I said, small groups, between 20 to maybe 15 or even 10 people per group. And they were going where their food went. So, what were they hunting? Mastodon, mammoth, wild pecari, which is basically uh, a giant big like rodent, uh, free toed sloth, giant beaver, and uh, you ran a landscape of animals such as a smiling on a saber tooth cat. So, essentially, they're going from place to place. And they're hunting with a very specialized toolkit. So, what I'm going to do is jump ahead a little. These are clovis points. And these things were used to penetrate the hide of a very large animal, such as the mastodon. And when doing that, they would hunt in small groups. They had numerous spears, and the group would go up, throw the spear, run away, grab more, go up, throw the spear, rinse and repeat, until the animal died on the spot, they butchered the animal on the spot, and brought the meat back to their camps. Now, like I said, Paleo Indians moved from place to place. They had to follow their food. They didn't really, and I'm not saying they didn't use things on the landscape, but they weren't making permanent settlement. They weren't permanently settling on a specific landscape. And so, over time, things start to change. And when we go through these timeline periods here, these are things that did not happen overnight. At one point, because we're going to go into the archaic period, during the early archaic, we still had Paleo-Indian people. But what was happening was a couple of things. One, the environment started to warm up. Five degrees, that's all it took. The environment warmed up, and the megafauna that couldn't survive left and or died off of the landscape. So what happened then, the landscape changed. And it basically resembles the landscape we have today deciduous forests, deer, raccoon, ducks, things like that. So the animals and the forests that we have today, minus all the invasive species, are more or less what the rest of these native people lived in, the landscape that they lived in. And so when we're looking at this, we're also looking at population explosion. Remember, paleo Indians, smaller groups moving from place to place. Someone passes away, they buried their dead on the landscape quite quickly because they still had to follow the animals. Once in a while, they met up with other Paleo-Indian groups to exchange knowledge, marriage, marriage, things like that, but they kept moving on the landscape. The archaic period, however, started to change all of that. And so, one of the things is population explosion, the other thing is change in technology. So when we're looking at the archaic period, we're looking from 10,000 years to about 3,000 years, give or take. And the technology would change. So you went from these beautiful spear points, Clovis, and by the way, just to show you how rare this is, I only ever saw one Clovis point come out of the ground in all my years of doing archaeology, and that was last spring. Okay, It just doesn't happen. You don't go out to a site saying, we're going to find a Clovis point. And the person, the assistant director of the state, who's a state expert on these things, that was the third time he ever saw something like that come out of the ground. He is the state expert on Clovis points. That's his field of research. So essentially, you go from large animals to the animals we have today, the technology has to change. You're not going to be able to run up to a deer with a spear. At this point, the device changes into what's called an atlatl, and it's a catapult, which launches long dart and stone tip, and they're deadly accurate. I've made them, I've used them, not as accurate. I don't know how many of you came here to Dennis Downs' thing a few weeks ago. He makes them, he, we go up on his back deck to launch him at this boar thing that he has out in the back of the target. Once in a while I hit it, but I'm not that accurate, so I guess I would die. Um, <laughs> But essentially, it makes it easier to launch these things at faster moving game, okay? But again, remember, we were talking about changes in landscape, population explosions, technological change. So when we look at the early archaic, aside from that, we've got now hunting and gathering. They are starting to gather material from the landscape. 
uh, native plants are being utilized. By the middle archaic, which we see over here from 8,000 to 5,000 years, we're looking at semi-permanent villages. That means people are finally moving in and sort of staying. They're not following the uh, herd animals anymore. At this point, they're able to hunt, relax a little, and do what needs to be done to survive on the landscape. And then from late, which is about 5,000 to 3,000 years ago, at this point, we are looking at larger villages trade uh, small darts at this point because the atlatl had a larger dart, and again, a population, a population increase. Now, the hallmark that changed between the archaic period and the woodland period used to be pottery. But archaeologists are finding pottery now on late archaic archaeological sites, which is pushing pottery further back in time. So by the late archaic period, we start to see pottery. Now that doesn't mean people did not have a form or a method to carry water. They just used skins. We know this. Um, going back to the Paleo-Indian, bone needles. Bone needles indicate manufacturing clothing and other things. So it's logical that they would use something. If we to, to carry water, if we found pottery on the sites, it would push it further back. But as of right now, we know that they they just didn't use pottery from the uh, from the middle archaic going back. But again, over time, natural resources um, were becoming, quite frankly, the more we had a population explosion, fewer natural resources were uh, had on the landscape. So by the early woodland period, we start to see permanent dwellings. So at one point with the late archaic, we have villages. That's great, but they're still moving from place to place. But once you get to the uh, woodland period, now we've got permanent dwellings. They're not going anywhere. Now they're settling an area permanently and utilizing the things in and around it. At this point, we also see mound building, an increase in pot pottery, uh, and now we're starting to see people utilizing annual seed crops. They're going, they're gathering seeds, they're creating gardens. By the middle woodland period, we start to see great regional trade and ritual barriers. Regional trade is interesting because even going through, quite frankly, the Mississippi period where trade becomes, quite frankly, throughout the continent, regional trade allows people to bring in goods, things that they need to use within the Chicago area, and then export most likely would have been shirt and uh, game for things like that that can be traded back and forth. Uh, with other people within the Great Lakes region. So they were starting to travel around. So by the time we reached the late woodland period, the biggest technological change, bows and arrows. So now you go from spears, atlatls, to bows and arrows. Now you can go ahead and carry a quiver. You've got more of these darts shrink down, more arrows, and you can hunt fast game, and you can get it in quantity. And eventually, we go from that, and what sort of, again, tips it into the Mississippian period. Well, around the late Woodland period, I forgot to mention, corn agriculture is big on the scene. However, populations explode, and eventually the Woodland transforms into the Mississippian period, which is around 1,000 years, and then to about 500 years ago. And at that point, we are looking at um, major corn agriculture, shell-tempered ceramics is important. Earlier in the woodland period, not the early woodland period, but during the woodland period, they had grit temper, which is a grit, black sand. In this case, Mississippians understood, hey, if we add shell to this mixture, it's going to strengthen it. Pottery became thinner, durable, less pr uh, prone to being destroyed by dropping compared to their woodland uh, counterparts. But they relied on corn so much that believe it or not, the Mississippian people were actually shorter than the woodland period people. Now again, I brought up Cahokia, that's southern Illinois. Cahokia was a very large trade network. It was larger than London at the time. It had over about 40,000 people at its height. And at that point, they were trading people with people from Mexico, the East Coast, West Coast, and up into Canada. And if you go up to Aslan in Wisconsin, you'll see a religious outpost. 
that is a Cahokian religious outpost. They made their way all through what is now the Chicago area, up into Wisconsin, and establishing religious outposts along the way. Now that said, over time, people change, population change, technology changes, and eventually different tribes move into the area that we mentioned before. This is, and at one point, eventually it was bound to happen in the summer of 1673. You have Marquette and his friend pop into the area, and this is when historic Chicago typically starts. When you read books on historic Chicago, especially if some of the more outdated ones, they typically say people lived here for thousands of years, they raised corn, beans, and squash, and in 1673, a couple people showed up from Europe. That, and this is the beginning of Chicago history. So this is typically where I ended. And the reason why I put the uh, forest preserves is because I actually worked don't judge. I was the archaeologist for Cook County Forest Preserves at one point. I actually worked, by the way. Um, <laughs> but that said, it's from about 1869 to about 1915, this concept of land, uh, to save the land, sort of became a reality. These people got together and said, hey, we need to conserve areas, we need natural spaces. And over time, they started to acquire land. And about 1915, the Forest Reserves, at least the Cook County Forest Reserves, uh, came into effect, 1914-1915. Now, yes, that was a rush going through prehistory because that's just an outline. We could be here all night discussing this, but we've got interesting photos, so I'm not going to bore you with words anymore, okay? Except for the next thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> I lie, people. You're going to find that about me. I lie a lot. Um, so, why did I put this? Well, I deal with a lot of historical museums and history centers, and trying to get the concept of think outside of your boundaries is a big deal, right? You're dealing with people who are entrenched in their dogma, entrenched in the historical word. Those are just words. I'm a scientist. My faith is in data. And what is science? It is dispassionate. So, when we look at the record, a record is great when we have to add that to an archaeological context, but that's all it typically is. It's a supplement. So when I go into areas and people tell me, well, we haven't found anything here, or we have found things, but they don't indicate settlement, 13,000 years of people inhabiting the area, people settled the area, the landscape changes over time, even though the archaic people had the same trees and animals that we had. That landscape, the rivers, all of those things changed over time. So our rivers, our creeks, our ravines, those systems that we have in place today, that's us today. Thousands and thousands of years ago, yeah, they were there, but they were in a different form. Some things were there in the past that aren't there anymore, and there are things in the present that were never there in the past. So, I wrote that part up at the top about well over 50% of Chicagoland archaeological sites have been destroyed by urban expansion. So what does this mean? It means archaeological data has been completely obliterated by uh, farming and various construction over the past 200 years. 200 years is a long time, but again, not really. When you actually look at the maps of this area, you start to see plots popping up. In the 1830s, uh, the BLMs, the Bureau of Land Management uh, maps, actually show plots. And that was early 1830s, 1832, 1833. So that said, retinatory and historical records only provide a glimpse into the recent past or for order for a specific event. They can, like I said before, add to the archaeological study, but are not a full archaeological record. Why? Because early settlers and farmers and townsfolk were not versed in reading an archaeological landscape. Most people during the settlement period and well into the 1900s thought mounds and other structures were built by a mysterious race of mound builders and giants. Keep laughing, but it's true. People saw mounds and they're like, well, these primitive people could have built this. This is some big race. Think of Great Zimbabwe in the model. When people saw that, they didn't think that race of people could build something like that. It's the same thing with natives. This is manifest destiny. You look at something and say, you couldn't have built this, and you destroyed the people who built that. This isn't your land, so we get the data. 
But that all said, it's, you, you look at mound builders, yes, mounds exist, but the people I talked about when a mound builder came to play were the ones that built it. Now, Giants is interesting. I bring that up for a reason, because we actually have Giant War here in Illinois, and in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and elsewhere. Antioch, for example, has a legend about Giants being found literally across the street from, not across the street, you've been to this house, Dennis, across that little road, Giants. So what does that mean? That means, quite frankly, either, yes, you found a large human, buried, not a giant, it just happened to be most likely wooden buried people, or you have skeletons in the ground over time that have become disarticulated, and farmers and what have you don't know what they're looking at at the time, they're not scientists, they're doing what they're supposed to do. And so, wow, those are big, must be a giant. Believe it or not, happens more often than not. And then I get my conspiracy theorists who see axe heads like this. Well, those are just straight up ceremonial. When you see a massive axe head, that's all it is. But again, these are tools and implements of giants. Mm -hmm. So these things do exist. These ideas do exist. And believe me, just last week, I got a, an email from someone who's got paleo burials everywhere and things from giants, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> It, it can be insane. It's fun to think about, but I got a better chance of finding Bigfoot in the Forest Reserves than I do uh, these giants. So that all said, we move on to the final one so we can finally switch over to the next uh, screen. The archaeological record, or sorry, the archaeological and environmental studies more often than not change the historical narrative. I think I kind of explained that. So let's look at this on a local level. When we look at I gotta say this right, because I want to revolt. Lake Forest. And look at Lake Bluff. The historical record says what? It's mostly swamp, right? Ah, swamps, swamps, swamps everywhere, swamp, swamp. Chicago swamps, everything's a swamp. This is what the area looked like. Here we are, right here, and here's Lake Bluff, right there. And this, I'm colorblind, so bear with me, is forest. This is a pre-settlement. When I say this is accurate, this is scientific data. Archaeologists, state archaeologists added to this, state geologists added to this, the state people who work with the water, I forget what they call themselves, they added to this, and the forestry added to this. And what they do, and yes, you're not going to see it, but they go out, they do, they go out to the field. My friends with the archaeological survey are going through Lake County like a forest fire. And they're excavating sites and looking at stuff. Well, same thing with geologists, same thing with the forestry, same thing with the water people. They're going through, they park, very conspicuous, and they wander. They take soil samples. They look at the natural resources, such as the trees. They look at the vegetation. They look at the water, and they can tell what is an ancient swamp versus what is uh, a native section of oak what's in need of prairie by looking at these things, by looking at the soil, by looking at the composition of those areas and combining all of that. So this is a free settlement. And by free settlement, I mean before us, before Europeans. Now, this is from the Illinois Inventory of Archaeological Sites. I have access to that. It's classified. So technically, I shouldn't be showing you this, but I did actually remove the archaeological sites from it. Otherwise, it would be clustered with catalog sites. But I'm not supposed to give away sites. And while I'm going to show you pictures of things found at sites, I'm not going to give away exact locations. Because, believe it or not, I guess there are a lot of people out there looting these sites. So this is all forced, all of it. From Lake Bluff all the way up to whatever that word is, Great Lakes, whatever. All of this is forest when the native, when, when the Indians were living here. All of this is forest, all of this is forest. And then here we've got our friend of the Swains River, and then it's prairie. Uh-huh. But it's broken up by bits of woodland, which happens, right? This is your swamp. Right here, and here, and there, and bits of it here. So the historical narrative, believe it or not, says, People did not live here because it was swampy. But 
those were interviews conducted by people over 100 years ago. No offense to them, that's great, the historical record is intact, but at the same time, they don't know how to read the landscape. It's not like they went in, it's not like they were doing an actual exploration of the natural resources. They were interviewing farmers, they were interviewing people who were living their lives that were not well versed in this. And quite frankly, even back then, archaeologists who were a little more than collectors at the time, they wouldn't have known this either. Because many of those archaeologists would look at certain stone tools and also attribute them back to our friends, the Potawatomi, or Soft, the Box, and blah, 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 blah. The problem is, when those people were here, the trade systems were already going on. They had things from European trade from, from further east. So this is pre settlement. And then these swatches here, this color, which I'm assuming is yellow. Uh, someone's got it for it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Don't make me walk out of the house with two different socks on. Um, so essentially, yes, these are cultural, uh, uh, this is culture, essentially. So some of it was left on for the pre-settlement, but the actual archaeological sites which bolster this, I removed all of that. And the reason why I left it is because this one is important to what we're going to be talking about in a few, and up and around here. But up here in Lake Bluff, there's also some culture going on. And then we go all throughout, in between. Remember, people live by water. When you find water, when you find a junction of rivers, of creeks, things like that, well, high drain landforms, that's where people live. And this was a giant, high, well drained landform. I mean, it's even in the name, Lake Bluff up there. If you look at it, down here, forest, well, guess what? It was all forest. So, Let's look at it, what it would look like today as an overlay. Here we are, here's the other address, and here's your swamp. Cutting through. Not much. You got a couple of golf courses in there, some stoky uh, waterways and things like that. You got your little waterway going here, and somewhere over here, there it is, it's playing where we're cutting through. Whoops, I forgot to move some of the archaeological data off of it. Don't tell anyone. So that's what it essentially looks like when you overlay it. You can see there's no swamp whatsoever in this area. So what does that mean for the localized area in which we're sitting? Well, uh, we're somewhere up here. By the way, that's a like this. I had to turn on my computer to my database. This is part of my own personal database, but this is called the Garrison Site. How many guys have ever heard of the Garrison Site? Yeah big site that was found when they were putting in subdivision a long time ago. And this fine establishment we're all sitting in actually has the archaeological records for it. A couple of friends of mine actually excavated the garrison site. But let's put the overlay on that. Here's the garrison site. Wait, where's my little indicator? Huh. Well, whatever, it's right here. So you have the garrison site, and look, most of it is submerged in that swamp. Why? Well, if you look at the landscape, like I was saying before, this swamp didn't exist yet. This site, which is archaic, and yes, it has woodland period components in it. That means woodland period people lived at the site as well. This site predates the swamp. So this whole swampy area came after the habitation. Uh, so essentially when you have people coming in and building homes and whatnot, well, of course, we all know that most of the swamp area had been drained and eventually dried out and eventually turned into a neighborhood, thus disrupting uh, that specific archaeological site. And that's why the garrison <laughs> site is found today. And they got that little pond over there. That's just a man-made pond. So that's the sort of localized now, when you go through the Chicago land area, you have to pay homage to the people who came before you, sort of stand on the shoulders of giants. And my favorites come in three forms. Albert Sharp. I don't know, how many of you have heard of Albert Sharp? <laughs> I know, and I know Susan up front has heard of Sharp as well. She's got bits of his map in the book. Albert Sharp was an antiquarian archaeologist, and he worked 
all throughout the Chicagoland area. He would travel to various uh, areas outside of the city proper, and he would explore the sites. People would write into him and tell him their sites where they would tell him what they found. He would go out and amass a large collection of materials, and he meticulously mapped and noted just about everything. His, his maps are pretty accurate. Uh, for what they are, for what he did back, in, back during that time. Now, unfortunately, his entire collection of, of lithic material and pottery disappeared at one point. I know Chicago Historical had some of it. A lot of it went to the Field Museum. Eventually, uh, it wound up in the Educational Department, which translates that it wound up being used for public education, and most of it disappeared over time. Some of it, of course, was destroyed uh, when there was a college that actually burned down. They had it in the museum, and some of the materials were destroyed there as well. But he was meticulous. His materials can be found at the Chicago Historical Society. And I mean, I've looked through his books and maps and his documents, and it's interesting to see how he went about it. He documented in his little books, you know, how far something was going to be, how much the train ticket was going to cost, how much was lunch, how much was the lodging at the time, and then the sites themselves, what he saw, what he collected, what did he think. But again, his mindset, he would look at earthworks, and some of them he would call fortifications. There's areas around Antioch where he looked at them and called them uh, Native American uh, sacrificial areas because of the bones found at the location. So even though he sort of had a training by a professional archaeologist, he grew up uh, near uh, near Star Rock, he still didn't know how to really read some of the landscape. So he was a good example of that antiquarian archaeologist. And by the way, he was active, as you can see at the top, 1862 from uh, until 1925. And then we have Carl Dill. Now Carl Dill, contemporary sharp, did the same things. Except he also sketched much of his findings. It's really interesting to see his material as well. On little flippy notebooks, big pieces of paper, just about everything. He amassed a collection, that collection, of course, most of it has disappeared, disappeared, just like the Sharp collection. But at least his sketch maps give us an insight as to what these things look like. And he and Sharp both reported to the early Chicago Historical Society. At the time, it was in a building which, in my day, in my younger years, used to be Excalibur Nightclub. You'd go up to the club, and above the door, it said Chicago History Museum, and eventually it became some kind of Japanese fusion thing, and then I don't know what it is now. But the building is still there, but that was the original Chicago History Center. The only cool thing about Sharp or a build is that uh, I found a love letter in his notes, and apparently he started dating it first curator of the Chicago History uh, Museum. And uh, he actually wrote a cute little letter saying, thank you very much for yesterday. The Italian rice did my stomach good, and I think I love you. So it was very touching. I've got to go back and actually find that, make a copy of it. Now, I don't know if any of you know who Ed Lace was. Maybe you've heard of him. He was a good friend of mine. He used to be a Cook County Forest Preserve archaeologist. But he wasn't a formal archaeologist. He didn't have an advanced degree. But I can guarantee this man forgot more about archaeology than a lot of archaeologists could hope to know when it comes to the sites in the area. And he used to live in Evanston. And so once in a while, I'd hop over to his house. Now, when I say he had a collection, it was in the garage at the time. He's been doing that since the 50s and worked his way up until he retired, and he still went out. He personally handed maps to me with his own writing on them. Usually you get a scan or two, but he handed these things to me, and he was kind of an idol of mine. I found his, uh, when I was younger, my mother would clip out newspaper articles and whatnot. He was in one of them. Um, so I would go and visit. And I swear, it was like dangling a cookie. We'd be in his living room, and he had this particular way of talking, very, uh, he had a sort of, a, so I'd be like, yeah, what do you, what do you got in the graph? Uh, yeah, I got the bones of a Frenchman in there. <laughs> Found it in a dirt pile. I'm like, can I go see? Well, it's not dark out there. 
So we're not going to go out there. You should see the stone tools they got. I mean, you just go through and tell me about all these things that he had. I'm like, really? So I go back every time. It was that night. He didn't want to go out there. Well, eventually, the state came. He had tried for years and years and years to get the state to do something. Eventually, they came. They removed the materials. They brought them down the state. And it wasn't until I went to retrieve the headstone of Alexander Robinson that I went to the warehouse. Yes, sir. Big warehouse in Springfield, not making itself. Kind of like the end of Raiders of Lost Ark. Now, you walk in the door, there's a corridor, you've got canoes, you've got mastodon tusks, all this fun stuff. You open doors, and then there's just more of it. And then the headstones, which we were able to recover, they were placed there for safekeeping until we got to go and retrieve them. And as I'm walking toward the stone pools, there's these big embankments with the wheel on the side, and uh, it was the entire lease collection. So they let me twist the wheel, open it off, and I got to take pictures and finally see the things old Ed wouldn't let me go in the garage to have a look at. So this man has added to the archaeological map, just like Hill and just like Shark. So recent discoveries, when or where and what? So you have all these maps, you have all these people. Here's my database. That's just Chicago. I have visited all of them. Okay? I've been doing this for a long time. Can't really see Chicago, but here you have the Indian boundary lines, so at least this gives you some idea where we're at. But we are literally covered in archaeological sites. So this goes back to when people tell me natives didn't settle here, take a look. But be fair, not all of this is prehistoric or historic native or settler farm, this, that, the other thing, weird cemeteries that have disappeared, other historic cemeteries, which I added just because you have to keep everything in one database. And these are materials that I happen to have, the old Chicago Historical Society. I also have institutional names in there as well, uh, to sort of keep it straight. And then, essentially, what, uh, what I do is I take them and write forms and help um, deliver these things to the state. Well, I know we've been added to the database. Now, while I can't give away the archaeological sites, you squint, you can actually make up all of the breweries and distilleries. <laughs> Because beer is very important to archaeology. Without it, we just don't function. <laughs> and so I actually do put breweries and distilleries into my database. But let's get away from maps and start looking at sites. Here we go. A mound site in a woods somewhere in the Chicagoland area. And you see the mound here. We had to clear back the leaves in order to take the photos. This area was littered with material. Lithic material, lithic meaning stone tools, pottery, and other materials near a hiking trail. People walk by, thank goodness they don't really know what they're looking at. This is very sandy. Why is it sandy? Because it's glacial. It's all glacial fill. Everything here is formed by the glaciers. And we're familiar with that up here with all of our ravines and everything else. This is all a glacial landscape. But on top, when we had moved the leaves, was this very tiny lithic thing. So what is it? It's got little points on it. Could be an awl. Could be a kind of a griever or drill, perforator for leather and whatnot. But here's the key in archaeology. You don't know what it is. It's ritual. So it could be ritual. And that's the standing joke in archaeology. If we can't figure it out, it must be ritual in nature. So, but most likely it's a little tool for perforating leather or poking holes into bone and things like that. Here we have a Hopewell point. Now, we didn't get to that stage in the woodland period, but the Hopewell are part of the woodland people. This is, these are my feet, my walking stick. I had back surgery at that point, so all I could do was limp my way through the woods with a walking stick and a cigar and take pictures of things down on the ground instead of being able to bend over and pick them up. It was quite sad and funny, all rolled into one. But this at least shows you what it looks like from my perspective on a very narrow deer trail. This is an animal trail. These things are everywhere. You're going to find them. Here in Lake County alone, I found things in people's backyards they didn't know were there. Spear points, chirp plates from stone tool manufacturing. People were back there making stone tools thousands of years ago. And now the homeowners are grilling pork chops, you know, in the 21st century. But this is, I zoomed the camera in so you can get a better view of the actual tool itself. Now, 
it's illegal to collect these things. Okay? Yes, I'm an archaeologist, but if I don't have a permit, I can't collect them. But for the average person without the permit who isn't doing an archaeological study, it's against state and federal laws to take anything or disturb anything archaeological on public land. If it's private land, going back to people grilling pork chops in the yard and we find things, they can keep it. It's their private property. The only thing that is truly off limits at that point are burials, both on public and private land. It's against state and federal laws to disturb those things. Now, when I found this point, I thought, you know, I'm going to add this to a lecture eventually. Let me take a picture of what is behind me, where I'm standing. So I took a picture of the tool, then I turned this way, and I took a picture of a parking lot with a little outhouse and uh, that car. And so I remember when I worked for Cook County Preserves, because I had my ID, that's when I explored this area. I had my ID, I had the shirt, the whole nine yards, I'm out there doing a survey, and a cop rolls up, Forest Preserve police officer. He's like, hey, what are you up to out here? Well, I'm surveying archaeological sites. He nodded, he's like, cool. What, what is that? Well, essentially, I just found uh, uh, some stone tools, and actually, just to let you know, because near this area, there is a big village, a Mississippian village, that has mounds, the mounds are still there. And it's just scattered with lithic material, and pottery, and all sorts of fun stuff. I said, just to let you know, if you see people kind of poking around back here, I want to let you know that there's a village over there as well, a village site. And he looked at me and he said, I'm not kidding, you can't make it up. Is it supposed to be there? I said, well, not exactly. If you can move it a couple of feet to the right, that would, that would help me out greatly. I told him, me old being one of us. All right, so we're moving on. Woodland and Mississippian period points. These are true arrowheads. These were found on a river terrace. This one wasn't. This was found on a river terrace on the Swing River. It's an eight foot river terrace. There's a trail sort of cutting in before it enters the water. Why? It's a shallow area, and deer were actually making their way down. You can see the hoof prints in, in mud. So they made their way down and they uncovered this material. This, was a, this is at the junction of another big village site, a multi-component site. Multi-component meaning I can find an archaic, woodland, and Mississippian things there, as well as burial mounds. And to use the term for our dear departed friend Sharp, uh, forts, essentially, what he termed forts. But it's not a fort, it's just earthworks. And they're still, you can see it today. So this piece is probably in the Swing River now, but I cataloged it, GPS, took notes, the whole nine yards. And this Madison point, where I found that, near a mound, I found it here. And right about here, the edge of the carpet, that was a curb, and this was a busy street, just a high traffic area. And to this day, I still make my wife listen to the same thing when we drive through. We are now going down the street, and we are now bisecting. We are in the middle of an Indian village. It's gotten to the point where she knows when that's coming up. She says, don't even, don't even say it. I know we're going through an Indian village. You don't have to point it out. I don't listen. I still do it. That's love. So here we have a knife blade. Broken tip. Found it at the base of a giant oak tree. Let's go to the giant oak tree. So you can sort of see it right about over here. And this, again, is in another forest reserve not too far from here. So it's interesting to see. You've got shirt plate materials as well coming up out of the ground. It's interesting to see. In the 21st century, these materials are still there. They are everywhere because for 13,000 years, people inhabited this land. Here is yet another uh, broken spear point. Again, found nearby in the woods uh, in a rather large site. At one point, we also found serrated uh, stone tool lithic material as well, so points with serrations on the side. Um, yes, the general term that people use for all stone tools, they're arrowheads, but again, we briefly went through the prehistory, not everything's an arrowhead. That came much later. So everything before the woodland period, they're usually spears, knives, at Labyrinths, things like that. So Debitage site, why am I showing this to you? What is Debitage? It's just 
broken material. It's, a, it's an area where people were making stone tools. This whole area is covered, and I am not kidding you, in thousands of broken pieces <coughs> of chert rock. Bless you. Someone, a thousand years ago, sat here with a group of someone's making stone tools. This is not far from here. They made stone tools at this site. And in fact, you can find broken stone tools littered in the actual church at Taja. This is near a trail. People hike and bike past it every day. This site was cataloged, waypointed, uh, and the material sent to the state of Illinois. Here's a smaller version of what that site would look like. This was just off of a parking lot. All of these are church plates. Some people will say Flint. Flint and Chert are the same thing. It's a crypto-crystalline found in uh, limestone deposits. But then you also have scientists fighting with each other, literally screaming over Flint or is it Chert. I'm not going to get that battle. It's just Chert or Flint. Either way, someone made stone tools out of it. And it's all laying there, um, representing the people who put it there thousands of years ago. So because we had our friend Dennis, I thought I'd add Carol Mark tree that I had found. This has long since fell into the uh, creek. How many of you guys came to Dennis's presentation? All right, so you guys know what, what the trail marker tree is. I'm assuming other people may know what the trail marker tree is as well, having read or studied things online or in books. But the trail marker tree is nothing but a, a street sign for people of the past. That's really all it is. It's pointing toward forging areas where you can, uh, <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, fording areas where you can ford across the creek or a river. This is a creek, but that really wasn't there, but the displaying rivers nearby. And even in historic maps, it shows up as a fording area. So the tree actually points. They were using it, and eventually settlers came and used it as well. I get the question all the time. Why would Native people put trail marker trees in if they knew the landscape? This wasn't meant for people who knew the landscape here. This was meant for our town folks. When you go up to Antioch, that's had a ground out on Main Street. That was the Mukwango, Mukwango Trail and Main Street itself in Antioch, and it goes up to Mukwango, Wisconsin. And there were trail markers all along that area. And if you actually follow the old trail, it comes down through Antioch, eventually goes through what is now Vernon Hills, goes down into King Park or whatever that little golf course is on Milwaukee, and cuts right across the river and it falls in line with Ryerson Woods Main Drive and goes eastward to the lake and then splits off a little bit going north and then going south. If you go to Ryerson Woods today and you're driving along the main drive and you look off to the right, there's still a trail marker tree there pointing that way toward, toward the lake. So that was meant for people who were not from the local area. What's interesting is just north of this is a massive, and I mean massive, historic garbage dump from the 1800s, and it was used all the way through the early 1900s. This jump with its section, that's post-1860s. 19, 19, um, probably ranges from the 1870s through maybe even the uh, 90s. So it's an you know, old whiskey jug. Well, we actually had one in the museum that I worked for years ago in collections. It was still sealed. It had the cork, had a little bit of whatever on top of it. Every now and again, you go down to the collections, tip and have a whip, and it smelled like the most buttery Jack Daniels. See what I mean? I'm a big whiskey fan. Yes, I've got happies and stuff at home, but that was one of the most beautiful whiskey smells. Everyone would just go, you couldn't help it. It was, it was right there. So this is a site that unfortunately is sub subjugated to looting and illegal off-road. And these are tire tracks here and here, four wheels. And right in the middle is this archaic spear point with a quarter, because I forgot my photo scale. I also found an accent at this site, an archaic accent. Uh, I think it's in the next slide. I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, so this is a massive prehistoric and historic site. There was a big burial mound found there. It was excavated during the, during the 1960s. Uh, and my friend with the state currently wrote a book about that site and how it ties into other sites within the area. But that said, the reason why I put it historic is because it was also a farm site. And the mound itself was in the middle 
of the barnyard. And now it's all forest preserve. However, my friend, who's still alive, that was his aunt and uncle's farm. And across the street in the forest preserves, that area was his uh, grandfather's farm and his father's farm as well at one point. Now it's all forest preserve. So you've got that, but you also have this. That's an archaic three quarter group stone axe. And so you have the group here, and this is where the hat, where the handle would have been hafted around here, down to here. So you use it to cut down the trees. You can cut down a tree in less than eight minutes when it's when it was fully sharp. You see, you took a piece of limestone, limestone pecking and grooving. It took a while to make these things. You would peck it with a rock, you would bang it to sort of break material off, and then you would grind it to get the form that you wanted. So when I found this, we had just completed GPR work across the street at another site, I had friends at the field museum come in. And so the guy who's going to supposedly come with me, come here on the 7th with me, not the 8th, it's actually the 7th, um, when we talked about Robinson, he was with me the day that we found this. But all that was exposed of this was just this little corner here. This was it. And what was funny was earlier that day we joked about with another scientist how my friend and I were competing to see who would be the first one to find an axe at. And again, I worked for Cook County Preserves at the time. So all that was exposed was just this. And we're walking along where the ruts were, and you could see bone. It was old deer bone from native people who cooked their meals, and charcoals coming out of the side. And then I looked and I saw just a corner, and I'm like, this looks like an axe head. And it's like anything. We can pull it out of the ground and find out it's not an axe head. So I said, let's just savor the moment. I slipped my trowel under, and then you see it's not an axe head. So I slipped my trowel, pried it back, and out popped the blade, and I saw the edge. And I just looked at it, and I said, it looks like I won the bet. But, so we found an axe head at the site, too. So hard stone tools, lithic, other lithic material and pottery still exist within our forest preserves and your backyards and along public places in our villages, towns, and cities. This is located near a creek. This is the Top section of a broken biface, a broken knife. It's woodland period, um, but that was found at that same site, the one with the axe head and the one with the, uh, we're almost there, with the spear point. This here is found at that same site as well. This is a historic piece or a historic component to that prehistoric site. This is the base of a smoking pipe, a German smoking pipe, which makes sense because my friend's aunt and uncle, they were from Germany. These pipes are later 1800s. They're pretty bad smokes. I'm a pipe smoker, and a lot of my friends who smoke pipes, they smoke these, and they, they all pretty much agree that they're kind of nasty when you smoke them. Um, but it was really cool to be able to find a little fragment of pipe that more or less belonged to maybe an aunt and uncle or um, someone earlier who was related to them at that site. But when we leave that particular site and look across the field, you can see the glacial landscape. You can see how the land just right, rises up. I came out of the woods and I took, this is actually a hill. It doesn't transfer well in a photo. But on the other side of this hill, straight ahead is a parking lot. This entire landscape has been sculpted by the glaciers. So that said, thankfully for you, we have come to our end of this. <laughs> see? Fire and glass of warm milk. Thank you. So now I'm assuming we're going to have questions. So if anybody has any questions, I have the handheld microphone in the back here. Just raise your hand and I'll walk over with the microphone for you all. When the area was transitioning from the mastodons and the really big animals down to deer and things, were there bison in the area? Uh, no, actually, at that point. That came a little later. So you would have megafauna, but there's a lot of, um, there were bison in Illinois, but a lot of that, a lot of those animals actually came in a little later after the megafauna left. You know, there's a lot of rumor and speculation, and unfortunately, we do get that um, when we look at the bison's uh, populations. Those are more of a 
quasi historic period, not historic meaning the contact, but a little more, I would say a little early, probably proto historic, is when they entered into our landscape. At the very beginning, um, we had the uh, uh, people came over at the end of the Ice Age, 13,000 years ago. When was the date? What's the date of the Ice Age? The date of the Ice Age um, would have been 13 plus years, quite frankly, going back about 20,000, even further than that. Um, here in Illinois, the ice by that point when people were here had receded. So we didn't have the glacial ice had they entered on that landscape would have been about a mile high from where we're sitting. So the landscape itself would have been in hospitals to those people entering into our in entering into what is now Illinois. The landscape itself at that time it was pretty barren. It was just scrub and spruce pine trees, things like that. The ice itself was at that point, long gone. And the landscape itself, um, it was transformed by the glaciers that had receded. So glaciers would come, glaciers would leave, glaciers would advance again and retreat, and it would scrape the landscape, it would deposit materials, <coughs> the lake levels would rise and fall, and eventually we have what we have today. You showed us on the map where there's Lake Bluff and, and Lake Forest are identified, and you had um, the forested area and then you had the swamp area. Can you put a date on that? Yeah, yeah. there we go. So that would be pre-1673. If we're talking about pre-settlement, that's what we're talking about. Because, like I said, when you're talking about anything further back, when you look, that's about it. When you look at the garrison site, the garrison site's now underwater. But about 8,000 years ago, that was a site. People were living there. So this landform would have been dry at that point. And eventually, as environments change, things sort of happen. And eventually, that became just a little swampy. You have rivers that shift. You have creeks that sort of meander with the rivers when they start to shift their banks. And even today, if you go through certain forest reserves, you can see where the old river banks once used to be, as opposed to the current ones where they're flowing now. You mentioned the Columbus people. Where did they come from? Uh, they came from the West, yeah. The West. And they're moving east. So, yeah, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of data. We're only talking about this because you have people that were coming from the east as well. And you also have new data being found. As an archeologist, we look at the data, we're constantly looking at change. But at the moment, still, everyone's still entrenched in the whole west thing. And when more data come, becomes available, that gets added to, people analyze and look at it, that's the science of it. They argue back and forth, sometimes a little too much, but these dates are being pushed back further and further. So. It's not like they're sitting static at these specific dates. So they will change. I had my old mentor used to tell me, what you know now is going to change in five years. <laughs> so, any other questions? Ah. Yeah, two. I was, I was curious about what you were just mentioning with uh, the dates getting pushed back. I recall uh, reading recently that there's some of the civilizations in, in uh, Bolivia and Chile and Peru. Mm -hmm. That dates are being set earlier than 15,000. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what are the different theories about different migration routes? Yeah. People are either traveling over land, but they're also coming uh, using smaller boats. So when you're talking about up here, you're talking about glacier, they started looking at the fact that people were coming from Asia, they're going to go to the land bridge, they're using small water vessels that are sort of taking, you know, hugging along the coast or not an open sea with these things. Um, other people just walked it because that's where the ice was. It just connected everything. But when you're looking at flow through that, people are going further down. They're walking through the U.S. making their way down through Central and South America. And again, you know, we're finding sites. There's a site in Georgia 
another site in Texas, these dates are being pushed further back, and I'm talking maybe close to 30,000 years. So, but we have to rely on the data, and so if you start seeing that in Illinois, then we can at least extend it. Otherwise, we're just making assumptions. Yeah, you're finding it there, but we're not finding it here. Let's find the data first to add to the theory. It's not like you don't want it to happen, you just need to have the data to go with it. It's, um, I forgot, it's, I had sort of this idea when we were looking at, um, okay, all right, I'm having my moment. But it's, when you're looking at, the, for example, the Georgia site, I think, uh, see, I need to look at that data too, I think they're actually pushing it back to maybe 35,000 years. Mm -hmm. I had a similarity with Illinois, but I forgot where I was going with it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> question, how are these sites, uh, man, I've been all over a lot of the woods in the area, how are they protected today? And then I have another question. They're not, they're just there. It's not like you can do anything. You know, it's against state and federal laws, but you know, people go in and take things. I mean, you shouldn't, but it happens. It's, yeah. yeah. But there is, now that I'm thinking about, there is one site south of here, far south. It's near the Indiana border. Someone was caught looking at that site. I actually know the person, unfortunately, because I want to state about this particular individual. They caught him looting it. The Forest Preserve Police, as well as the state individual. And so what they did was they put the trail cams. They put them all over the place. So I said, I asked, you know, my friends at the state, do you want me to go in and have a look around? I said, just let's leave that whole area alone. We're, we're monitoring it. And so what they did was increase police presence at the site as well. Okay, now, when you you're, did a lot of time in this particular area, but there's the whole country, are there a lot of you around? Archaeologists for everywhere, apparently. <laughs> yeah, there's, I mean, it is a thing. Every state has state archaeologists. Someone in counties have county archaeologists, and it's just how it typically goes. Maybe not Cook County. Cook County actually uh, contracted with the state of Illinois. Um, Lake County has no one. I was doing it on a volunteer basis for them, but essentially, yeah, there's we every every state has an archaeologist, a group of archaeologists. So, yes, I wanted to follow up on that question, and I had another one. Um, I think people think that archaeologists are something that universities would be doing. Why does the government feel the need to have archaeologists doing this? Oh, Roswell. Awesome. No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, it's kind of funny because I looked at the federal government description, and I've got family who work for the federal government. Government, there was a, a security clearance, a secret. I'm like, why do I need a secret? I, I just flat out, uh, when you guys got the Ark of the Covenant there, and I started being a wise ass with him. Um, but essentially, he said something along the lines, and he's like, I'm literally just making something up. But he said. In the case of archaeology, you might not only be brought in to look at a landscape. If something falls from the sky, i.e. comes from another country, let's not talk about the balloon. <laughs> oh, that was funny. Um, if it's whatever debris, anything, archaeologists along with the other specialists would be called in. Um, but quite frankly, they're brought in to look at federal lands. So when you're dealing with tribal issues, things like that, then uh, federal archaeologists would have been brought in and would be brought in to have a look at those sites. You said 50% of archaeological sites have been lost from the expansion of urban development and so on. Is there something that you'd love to find that you haven't been able to find, or you just don't even know what that is? You know, I have found human remains and things in other countries, and in Kenya specifically, <laughs> massive rock shelters, things like that. The one thing I wanted to see come out of the ground was a, um, it was a clothes point, and it was broken. It was only the medial, middle section of it. And so we were with a group of students, and they were field walking, and I happened to be behind them. And whenever they'd find something they couldn't identify, they'd call any of us archaeologists over. 
And so the particular student happened to find this. She put her flag, and I went to have a look. And it took even me a minute to realize what I was looking at, because again, you just don't think you're going to see a Clovis point. And I turned it, and I saw the two diamond-shaped patterns of the edges. And I literally looked at her, and I, did you know what you actually just found? You know, and I went into the whole speech of 13,000 years, blah, 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 blah. You explicatives, and then the state uh, expert, he happened to be with a group of students a little further up, so I kept calling him, and he's just doing this. And then eventually he walks over, he's like, what? Come with me. I picked it up, I put it in his hand, and he stared at it for a second, and it registered, and he said the same, are you fucking kidding me right now? Is this what I think? I go, yeah. He's like, are you kidding me right now? He's like, who found it? She did. I identified it, so I was the second person at 13,000 years of Yeah. Um, and so then he called another, he said, oh, we just thought you were getting excited for no reason. <laughs> and then he called his colleague over, and he comes walking over what? I put it in his hand. And it's literally verbatim of what the state expert had said, follower and everything. And he looked at me and said, we just thought you were getting excited. Well, I told them both where they could go with that, but it was a big thing. I mean, it was really, I mean, just a small piece of stone dating that far back, and this man's third time seeing that out in the field coming out of the ground. The poor man has yet to actually find one himself, which was part of the joke, but but he is the uh, he is the state expert, so it was really cool to see that. So I got to chuck that one off the bucket list. Do you know what the average life expectancies of people are during the various periods? I assume we're getting living longer as, as time goes on. Yeah, it's not, it wasn't long. You'd be lucky if you could make it in your 20s. By your 30s, you'd be very old. So I remember the people who came after the Woodland period, they weren't doing so well because corn basically it, it, it destroyed their bodies. They, were just, they ate so much corn as, you know, before you know, the previous people, the Woodland period people, they didn't eat as much as the Mississippians did. The Mississippians relied heavily on corn and it basically destroyed their uh, physiology. Do some of them in inherited, say, a box of arrowheads and other Native American artifacts, where would they begin to uh, get some information about donating it or making sure that it ends up uh, in an educational institution or somewhere that could be helpful? So you have a box of arrowheads? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Um, all right, all kidding aside, where, where, where were they found? Do you know? I mean, there's a couple things. If you, I mean, do you not want them at all? Or are you looking well, at them? I'm trying to declutter. Okay. Um, no, I mean, we, we would like them to go yeah. I mean, somewhere else. You know, I get that question all the time, and here's the thing. So, for example, stone tools, people, can we give them back to the Indian tribe? Well, good luck. <laughs> the, you know, the descendants of the people here, who were here, at least in the Mississippi, and they were the ho chunk so at least we sort of have that that lineage. But if you have axe heads, and I'm thinking what they're, do they have a groove in them? Or are they yeah. smooth? Yeah, yeah so that's archaic. She had a farm in the yeah. Mississippi River, and over the years, they just collected. I mean, you could call the state museum, ask if they want them. If in you want Iowa? Them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because theoretically, they come from that state, they should at least go back. The, but the thing is, again, one of the things I'm trying to say is when you look at natives, you have to, don't think of them in terms of, did they come from Lake Forest or not? Did they come from Lake Bluff or not? Did they come from Chicago or not? They roamed the landscape before these arbitrary borders. These things existed. There were these things did not exist. And you drive that into people's mind or brain, that's, that's kind of hard because people think with the only within their town limits. So these people roam the landscape. So those archaic people in Iowa are the same type of archaic people here. But because they're found from a specific site, your aunt's farm, if you tell them where the farm was, now you have lithics with a provenance that can be tied to that specific piece of land that can go to them 
and the state archaeologist or their archaeologist can then look and catalog it and say, these came from this specific site. I just did that with someone down in Palos. These materials were found on a farm, but now it's a school and a bunch of other kids. So I brought my friends in with the state. We came in, we took the lithic material, went through everything. We looked at the maps, we expanded the site boundaries just so we felt comfortable enough knowing we probably got the whole site catalog. And then it's catalog, but when you look at the data sheet, it says destroyed because there's a school there now. So that would be beneficial to them. Tell them who farmed, where it was located, give them as much information as you can. They can identify everything for you. And if you want to donate that to them, go, go ahead. From time to time, you hear about a place in Europe, maybe in Italy or Greece, where they're starting to build a parking lot and they come across arche archaeological ruins and they have to stop work and they can't do anything until it gets cleared. Do you have anything like that in the United States? No, nothing that cool. Not like that. It was, you know, you've got Rome that's built upon thousands of years. That's not. Saying the Native American stuff was not cool, but yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're going to see something like that, you're going to see an increase in maybe the South, in certain areas, Florida, and the East Coast, where you do have more of a buildup. And even here in downtown Chicago, really, when you rip a street off, a modern street, when you go to do some work, yeah, you do. You find cobblestone. There's an alley that I know of near one of the places I research. We happened to just walk past it one day and I looked down and there were wooden blocks. And those wooden blocks are free Chicago fire streets. The wood is still there, it's intact, you know, but going back and look. If somebody comes across a site like that, is there any rule that they have to? Oh, yeah, they. I'm sorry, I see what you. Yeah, so yeah, technically you're supposed to contact. You're supposed to contact your state, or if you're in that country, the, the uh, regional archaeologist, or in England, it's the county archaeologist, um, depending on where you are. But I mean, it's construction, and sometimes these things are ignored. I don't know if you guys ever watch that TV show, The Techerists, on Netflix. There's a scene where Andy is is uh, he uh, he's excavating the site. They're doing some construction work. You have to have archaeologists out there. He's working for a firm, a CR firm, for cultural resource management. And he looks over and he sees some, you know, he's excavating, he sees, or he uncovers a little bit of flagstone, and then he lifts the flagstone, and there's this beautiful Roman mosaic. And he calls the foreman over, and the foreman looks, and he's like, wow, that, that's cool, that's great. You know, not showing any emotion. So Andy takes some photos, and then the foreman's like, "Let me see the photos." The foreman's looking at the photos, making sure everything's great. You know, and they leave for the day. And he gets picked up by his his wife, and he's excited, and he goes to show her the photos, and they're gone. They're not on his phone. He's like, "Oh well, I'll take take more uh, photos tomorrow." I'll go back. Next day he goes back, goes to the site, he looks around. There's nothing. Then he starts to scrape, and there's nothing. And the foreman walks up, he's like, where is everything? And he, oh, Andy, it's the flagstones. One thing you miss when you're doing this is never look at the flagstones. <laughs> he was corrupt. <laughs> they looked at the flagstones, the construction company did away with everything. Yeah, they wrote it in, but guess what? It happens, they do that. Maybe, I mean, I'm not you know, gonna sit here and say that all of those archeologists are on the up and up, but you know, I'm sure that goes on too. But at the same time, you have construction companies, the last thing they want to find is human remains or anything that's going to stop the site. So, yes, sir. Uh, with the lot of fungus material found, is it safe to assume there have not been many documented mastodon or mammoth kill sites? That is safe to assume, but there have been documented mammoth sites. Um, all throughout the Chicago area. Kill sites. Not kill sites, I'm just talking straight up man in this case, yeah. Finding a kill site would be a little more rare. If you go north of here, near, um, what is that called, Great America, there's a Mastodon site out there. Uh, they were digging out a retention pond, and they came across a prehistoric forest 
help solution pine stumps. And he saw the pine needles, everything was there. They found elk bone, they found mastodon, they found everything mm -hmm. buried under that landscape. So, but to find that bogus kill site, that's another holy grail. Yeah. So, okay. Do you have any further questions? Okay, well, I'd like to say a few concluding words before we adjourn for this evening. Dan, thank you. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming out tonight and looking at the battle. And there. So, a few words before we uh, get ready to leave this evening. Uh, I wanted to again reiterate that tonight's program was co sponsored by Lake Forest Preservation Foundation. So, thank you to, uh, I'm sorry to Lake Forest Open Lands. Lake Forest Preservation Foundation is co-sponsoring one of our next programs. But uh, this program is a part of the Native Voices Initiative, as I said. For more information on that, you can visit Lake Forest Open Lands Association.org slash Native Voices. You'll see a list of their upcoming programs for a variety of institutions in the Lake Forest and Lake Bluff area. I also wanted to mention that we'll also be featuring plenty of other programming topics here at the History Center for the next couple months primarily focused on our current exhibit, The Ark of the Miniature, which focuses on the story of Narcissa, Lee Black Thorn, and her thorn rooms that she built around the 19th, 1930s and 40s. And so that exhibit on the other side of the building, I'll, we'll probably be open for another 20, 20 minutes. Uh, and so if you want to peruse through that exhibit, please feel free, but a lot of our programming in the next two or three months is focused on that miniature theme as well. So if that's something that interests you, please be sure to keep up to date with our weekly newsletter, which you can sign up for at the front desk. And then one final announcement, all of these programs that are free are made possible by our very, um, the people who really continue to have the most amount of effect here at the History Center is our current and ongoing membership group. So thank you to everyone today who is a History Center member. Your support continues to allow programs like these with exceptional guest speakers like Mr. Dan Malone to be able to offer programs like these for free. So if you're not a History Center member, we have uh, a couple ways to get involved here. I have some information at the back desk if you're interested in becoming a member. But until then, uh, thank you again to everyone for attending tonight's program. Thank you again for the presentation, and I wish you all a good night. Thank you.